So the next talk is Mike Bonanno of the Yes Men, and I think we'll just allow him to get started right away. Mike, please go. Thank you so much, and hello, everybody. Um, it's so good to be here participating in the chaos. Um, I can say that I've, I've intended to for years, um, but uh, finally, maybe due to the pandemic, I'm finally here. So um, it's, it's great to... Uh, to be here after observing from afar for about 25 years. Um, anyway, uh, I was told that the other day that I'm getting kind of old and that the yes men are elderly now. And so a lot of people wouldn't, you know, know very much about the types of things or what we had been doing. And I'll, I'll admit, I, I've forgotten most of it myself. So I, I looked through the, uh, I looked through the archives for something that would introduce uh, what we do a little bit. And um, I found this picture that you see uh, here where I'm holding up an Exxon Mobil card, business card. And then uh, Andy, who's uh, the guy that I work with at the Yes Men, um, the co-founder of the group, is there holding a National Petroleum Council card. And this is from an event that we were at in, I think, 2000 nine or so where we, uh, went to a conference, um, uh, in Calgary, Alberta, representing these two companies. Um, yeah, we've, we've been, uh, weaseling, uh, weaseling our way into events, conferences, and sometimes online types of, uh, uh, venues for over two decades now and, um, representing people in power, And we do one of two things. Either we do something satirical and funny in front of an audience that usually thinks we are the most powerful people in the room, or uh, we do something that is more um, utopian, where we announce the reality that we might like to see, like in our wildest dreams, what we might think ExxonMobil might say if they suddenly turned around and stopped being um, some of the world's uh, largest climate criminals and had a kind of reckoning and woke up and decided to uh, fight climate change. So um, anyway, uh, there's been a lot of things that have happened over the last two decades in terms of the media landscape and, you know, the sort of flexibility of reality that have uh, made our tactics more or less useful. Also, like who's in power politically makes a difference because this, the types of things that we do, this kind of mischief, we find works pretty well when there's um, people who are movable, who's uh, <laughs> in, in office. Whereas if you have a total despotic tyrant, then you have to go to more tactical methods instead of uh, the types of things that, that, that we do that are all about, you know, pushing um, political uh leaders to, uh, to change or about sort of bolstering uh, a movement, like creating some exciting, fun, entertaining, uh, media that, um, shows us all that the people that we're fighting are actually really, uh, fallible and no different than, than you and I, despite the kind of power that they hold. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and play a little video clip here. Hopefully it works. Um, this is a, a video clip from, uh, our second, third Yes Men film. We don't usually get arrested, but ever since the 1990s, Mike and I have been dressing up in secondhand suits and impersonating big and powerful people. Hello, uh, this is Reggie Lamprey calling. I'm from the Yes Bush Can campaign. Hi, uh, this is Kenneth Ring Spratt from the WTO. My name is Francisco Guerrero. My name is Fred. I'm from Halliburton. We weasel our way onto center stage. <laughs> At least for a little while. Mr. Osmond, you're not even on the directory of HIDE. You're not even listed. You don't even have a phone number. It's come to that, has it? 
the hoax was an elaborate one. For the first time, Dow is accepting full responsibility for the Bhopal catastrophe. For the prank which briefly knocked 3% of Dow shares. When the jig is up, it makes the news. It's a group of pranksters who call themselves the Yes Men. An activist group called Yes Men. It's not the way most people protest, but it's our way to say no to corporate greed. Oh. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. <laughs> so, um, to, I just want to give a little bit of backstory. I've made three films, um, three feature docs in the last, in the last 15 years, we release one, it seems every five years. That's kind of a compilation of a bunch of the antics um, that we've, um, the, the exploits, whatever we want to call them. Um, but a lot of people uh, ask, well, how do you start doing this? What, why, you know, not in addition to why, how? And it all kind of happened by accident. Um, I just wanted to start out by showing you the, the World Trade Organization headquarters in Geneva. Um, this is obviously a pretty large building uh, in one of the um, most expensive real estate markets in the world. And um, how did we get our first um, major kind of exploit like this was when we um, when we actually impersonated the, the WTO. And so, you know, this is their headquarters. This uh, at the time was our headquarters. You can see this little, little hut here is where we lived. Um, this is a, a, a meeting of the OMSE, the WTO. And of course, this is the kind of meeting that we used to have. Um, and so people would say, well, how did you end up representing the WTO on television, you know, on stage, at business meetings? Uh, here we are um, standing with several dignitaries in Australia uh, after a trade conference there. And uh, the answer was is, is actually way simpler than it needs to be. Like a lot of things with social engineering uh, it's actually a lot dumber and less technical than people imagine. Um, this is Andy at a computer. That that thing down there, that's called a that's called a computer. There's a television in the background, a CRT. Um, we had put up a website called gwbush.com that was meant to be a satirical website for George Bush, um, who at the time was uh, running for president. He wasn't president yet. Um, but you can see that his banner for his website said valuable, uh, said education values responsibility. It's the, the, the banner on the bottom. And then our banner at the top said valuable, educated, prosperous. These are subtle um, differences, but they're differences that um, make a big difference in, in English uh, because um, they're, and of course, in this one, instead of, sitting with his wife smiling in front of the Texas state Capitol. He's pointing his finger at black people. Um, so it was meant to be satirical, but it turned out a lot of people took it seriously anyway. Um, and uh, it got a lot of press coverage. This is <laughs> some old, uh, an old Netscape window, browser window here. Um, and then, um, Sorry, it got a lot of press coverage, and actually, uh, George Bush denounced it at several um, press conferences, and he made a famous quote at the time, although he made tons of famous gaffes, and at this press conference, he said about us, there ought to be limits to freedom. That was what he was suggesting when, when they asked what they should do about us for making this website that looked like his and made fun of him. Um, we put up a website at GATT.org, which a lot of people associated with the World Trade Organization because GATT, the Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, was the predecessor organization to the WTO and the predecessor, uh, the previously existing agreement. So um, we had that website. This is actually uh, Bretton Woods, where they first set up the GATT, uh, I believe, in 1946. Um, 
And then, of course, the WTO building that you've already seen on the shores of Geneva. Um, now, in the early uh, 1990s, the mid late 1990s, there was a big uh, global movement against neoliberalization and neoliberal policies. And the WTO was a big focus of that. And Andy and I were participating. This is one of the marches that you see of people, mostly in the global south, who were rebelling against the free market ideologies that were really uh, hurting the poorest of people in many of those countries. Um, and of course, there were protests, like the famous Battle of Seattle, um, which uh, was famous because it shut down the city of Seattle during a OMC meeting. And this is a, a great picture of a uh, of what it's like to be to be there <laughs> at that event, it was. Uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't be there. Me and Andy couldn't be there to experience this wonderful feeling of tear gas, and so feeling left out, um, we put up a fake website for the WTO. And again, it's a satirical website, but it's at gat.org, and unlike the WTO's websites that. Um, the WTO's website was very hard to find out how to talk to anybody there. Um, although they emphasized their transparency as an organization, um, they were very hard to actually speak to. And since their web page had literally thousands of pages of documents, legal documents that you needed to be a lawyer to understand, um, ultimately it wasn't very transparent. Um, and so uh, our website, on the other hand, gap.org, was very easy to hit the contact button and get in touch uh, with what a lot of people turned out to think was the, were the WTO. Now, that became news, and uh, the WTO issued a press release saying, warning, fake WTO website. Um, and so since they had actually then sent this press release to their entire mailing list, uh, the Google algorithm, which was fairly new at the time, um, ranked our, our website very high in the, uh, in the rankings just below theirs actually, without any warnings about it being fake. So many people would go to their real WTO website would fail to be able to get in touch with them, and then instead would actually come to our website. Um, and on our website, we posted these alerts, like fake WTO website misleading the public, just to make sure that people knew that we, that we existed. We wanted to help them, help the WTO do this work of, of warning people about the, the fakes, this sort of hall of mirrors. Um, so, once again, the word deplorable gets used in reference to us. This here is uh, the then director general of the WTO, whose name happened to be Mike Moore. Uh, and he was from New Zealand, very different. He's a former prime minister of New Zealand, very different prime minister than they, they have now, really. Um, but he held a press conference where he announced that he deplored fake, the fake website and said that they undermine the transparency. Um, and so of course we published this on our fake website as well. Um, and then immediately it gets picked up um, and widely, widely picked up by the press. Um, so without actually going to Seattle, we managed to actually engage the WTO and to get them to talk to us, to address us, and then to get several rounds of media attention that we used to try to redirect traffic to what was happening in Seattle, to what was happening on the ground with the movement. Um, and actually this for us, we'd been doing things like this before, but for us, this was like a really big win because we realized, wow, this took very little work. It was a lot of fun. And with absolutely no power, you know, you remember what our office looked like compared to the WTOs, um, we were able to um, sort of uh, do these moves that would um, 
uh, throw a much heavier opponent, um, like, like judo moves. <laughs> um, and so, uh, anyway, we got into it. So many people then were mistaking our website for theirs. Thanks to, um, the sort of internet being so new and the, the, you know, the, I mean, the web, the World Wide web and the, the way search engines worked, um, that, uh, we got a lot of email from people questions like, could you advise me of the relationship of Gibraltar to the WTO? And this is the treasury department of the Isle of Man asking us this question. So, you know, it's, it's fun. It's entertaining. This is, um, another question might be, I would like to interview a WTO spokesperson on South America's new technology sector. Um, by the way, on the relationship of Gibraltar to the WTO, we explained in detail how Gibraltar was a rock south of Spain, a really big rock <laughs> in the, basically in between the Mediterranean and, and the Atlantic Ocean. And the WTO was this, you know, human construction, imagination, organization, <laughs> very different thing. Um, so we, could, we became experts basically very quickly overnight. Um, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. And then finally, uh, we were so good at it. So good at being the WTO that we started to get invitations. Can the director general Mike Moore address our conference in Salzburg was a, a question we got. And, uh, well, this is Mike Moore. This is what he looks like. And we realized, damn, we can't, we can't possibly be that guy. Um, you know, this is a problem. We can't send him either. Um, so we wrote to them and we said, well, we can't send you director general Mike Moore, but we would very much like to send a substitute. And that's when they embraced the idea of An Andreas Bickelbauer, Dr. Andreas Bickelbauer, which is a name we got out of the Vienna phone book, actually a, a friend of ours, uh, Hans of Uber Morgan had, um, sort of sponsored our trip by uh, leaving some cash on the table of his apartment and uh, leaving us the keys. So when we, when we, we arrived in Vienna um, with our new thrift store suits, um, we were immediately ready to go to this conference as the World Trade Organization. So that's sort of how it happened in the beginning. This uh, adventure in mischief, which is now lasted 20 years, um, doing these things in person, um, was something that just, uh, almost sort of like occurred spontaneously. But then once we were onto that and into that, it became quite a energizing and addictive sport thing that we've got a sport coat that launched us, uh, onto the 20 years of fun and excitement. And, um, we haven't quite landed yet, but I'm, I'm worried about that landing because it could, could be a rough one. <laughs> so I want to just frame what we're doing a little more. Uh, you know, some of you probably recognize this guy. This is Santa Claus. This is an actual photograph of Santa Claus emerging from a chimney, looking at a photographer who happens to be crouched in this room in somebody's house, uh, they both had to break in, in order to do this. And so my, my point here is that, you know, we love mischief. We love mischief and we actually even love trespass. We love breaking in. We love breaking and entering, uh, the stories of crossing borders, crossing boundaries, changing shape, putting on disguises, the masquerade. These are the stories that um, really carry us through history. You know, they're, they're, the, they're, they're some of our oldest stories. And this season with Christmas is no exception. Now, the stories have been hijacked and manipulated in a number of ways, just as all information and stories are uh, in our culture. And, you know, Santa Claus's reckless break-ins um, in order to leave gifts have become something uh, hijacked by capitalism or in part created by capitalism. But the fact that we want to lean on this idea of him trespassing, I think is, is really important. It's a key to something. So remember, don't tell anybody though, as Santa Claus would do. So, uh, we have 
this this history uh, we see it fitting into something that's sort of common to all cultures, and this is the the idea of the trickster. Um, this is uh, often a, a deity, or sometimes it's actually based on a real historical figure that's more recent. Um, but all cultures. Uh, have these, I won't say all, but nearly all cultures have these trickster characters. Um, there's a few listed on this uh, sort of cartoon image here. Um, Cocapelli of the Hopi or the Zuni, um, which is, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the United States, in the uh, North America, original people in North America, Anansi, the spider of West Africa, the raven in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it goes on and on. Um, because they're, they're everywhere. Everybody has these. And it doesn't take too much digging to find out about your own trickster character and your culture. And since we're kind of in, I think, mostly in Germany right now, um, and actually my mother is Dutch, so uh, I'm going to stick with, uh, I'm going to go with Reynard the Fox, or the Fox as a, as a character, as a trickster character. And so we're going to look at a little bit more history through the fox's lens to frame the types of things that we're doing um, through the eyes of the of the trickster. Um, Jesus, another trickster, <laughs> and I'm you know I'm not a big fan. Um, although I am a fan of some of his original tactics, you know he rode in on this donkey, and this is an actual photograph of him because you know somebody had a time machine and went back and got this shot of him riding a donkey uh, into Bethlehem. And, uh, you know, this is like nobody rides a donkey um, or into Jerusalem. Nobody rides a donkey. It didn't make sense. He did it because he knew that people would talk about it. It was a symbolic action that was meant to uh, project a kind of humility um, and, and, make people tell stories about what happened. So the idea was to propagate this myth, which of course worked so well that now we have, you know, we have Christianity. Um, but here's Nasruddin riding a donkey backwards a century later. Um, <laughs> and again, an original photo. Um, this is uh, sort of a, a wise sage coming from uh, out, of, out of Turkey and part of Islamic tradition. Um, and uh, again, all these stories, though, are stories of, of a kind of a wisdom. And these are sort of the, the reason I say they're tricksters is that they were um, fighting larger powers. I mean, you know, Jesus was fighting the Romans. Jesus was uh, leading a movement of liberation at the time. It became something entirely different. Um, but, uh, you know, we see the same thing. Yeah, this this version of the trickster that's Nasruddin as like a wise man um, is usually about telling a story where uh, uh, through cleverness uh, and sometimes uh, agility, a character can outwit others who have more power, who, who, would, who would otherwise exercise power over them. I mean, there are good tricksters and bad, but, um, you know, we like to focus on the idea of the good trickster, which is those who are fighting power instead of those who are serving power. Um, so here's another example, a modest proposal. This is a pamphlet, um, published by, uh, Jonathan Swift, where he suggested that the Irish eat their babies, um, in order to solve the hunger problem in Ireland, because of course, uh, the potato famine was not a famine that was caused by uh, lack of food in that country. It was caused by lack of money, as most famines are. Um, the British were still shipping grains out of Ireland because they made money when people were starving to death because the, the potato crops had failed. So um, this is a comment on that. Well, why don't the Irish just eat their own babies? And... Uh, and it was, it's become one of the most famous examples of, uh, you know, English satire, um, in history and English language. That is, this is the 1700s. So, um, the whole point here is that this pamphlet, like a lot of the sort of hacking techniques that we end up using now, this pamphlet was like disguising itself as something else when it was first published. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to skip ahead. Um, these are a few pictures of the women's movement, but I, I want to get through this stuff quickly. The whole purpose here is to show you that, uh, again, this obsession with stories, with infiltrating, with causing um, trouble, which they did, <laughs> is um, is something that's constant and has continued to, to happen and to occur. Hang on a second. Yeah. I'm showing I have low power, but... I have a power problem. Um, I'm going to have to go and get another power supply because this one is not working. Um, but uh, this is a, a group called Climate Rush that was uh, that was repeating those actions. Um, so uh, I'm going to run off and get another power supply. I will be back in just a moment. I'm going to leave you with a picture of um, of, of Gandhi's Salt March. Now, just a minute. This is actually Srimad. Uh, Srimati uh, Naidu, who is uh, leading one of the salt marches. I'll be right back. I will use this interruption to remind you that you can ask questions at the hashtag RC31, one spelled out as a word on Twitter and Mastodon, and uh, also on the IRC. And now uh, we all sing some songs together and wait. Hey, everybody. Sorry. Ah, oh, there are good. Haha. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. That's not the thing that I expected to stop working. Never had a power supply just stop in the middle. Okay. Well, um anyway, uh I was also gonna say that a lot of the stuff that we get inspiration from are comes from principles of nonviolence. Um uh going where you're not supposed to go, crossing borders. This is again trickster ta tactics. So the tactics of civil disobedience are the same kind of tactics that we use when we uh, infiltrate and do something at a business meeting. Um, you know, it's, it's doing something illegal, something that it is illegal, but might, of course, have uh, just ends in mind um, or might even be the, the right thing to do. So the Salt March in India um, during the Indian independence movement was where, you know, people marched to the sea and made salt, um, which was illegal because it was being taxed by the British. And it's one of the ways that the, um, the British crown was um, suppressing uh, the, uh, the local populations and, and preventing uh, India from having autonomy and from being able to um, uh, break the yoke of colonialism. So, um, Again, the idea was to try to to to, um, to cross those boundaries and to do it in a way that um, was visible to the world. Um, another example is the uh, bus protests in the United States during the Civil Rights Movement. This is a, a woman, um, actually, well before Rosa Parks, who's this this photo here is of. There was um, this woman whose last name was Morgan, uh, who. This is over a decade earlier, who was riding on the bus and refused to give up her seat. And uh, so there are many, many people doing these sorts of tactics, which were really about crossing these borders, crossing these boundaries. Um, all right, I'm going to move ahead here through a few more slides um, of occupations, things like the American uh, Indian movement um, that was... Uh, Sorry, this is Indians of all tribes occupying Alcatraz, saying this is this space is ours. This is after the prison had left the island. This is just off the coast of San Francisco in 1971. And again, it's Standing Rock. Same kinds of tactics, occupation, refusing to move, then getting moved by the authorities in a display of violence that shows uh, really um, that that should in theory, at least, be embarrassing for those wielding power when they claim to be benevolent. 
Um, billboard alteration, another tra simple transgression, you know, it's just like going up there and uh, changing a billboard. Um, street signs, you can change the street sign to Malcolm X Street, which is something that in the early 90s I was doing in, in Portland, Oregon. Um, and this was in protest of them uh, not naming a street for Martin Luther King. Um, sometimes it's as simple as changing an existing sign, like Hollyweed. I show this because it's a successful campaign. You know, weed is now pretty much legal in, uh, well, it's legal in California, and, and it will be soon, probably, in most of the United States, if not all. Um, and things like banner hangs. Again, going where you're not supposed to, getting your message there. Um, if you don't have the money for a banner, you can draw it on a beach. <laughs> um, you can put on a costume like Super Barrio in Mexico City. Um, this is after the uh, earthquake in 1987. This guy showed up wearing a wrestling outfit and um, demanded rights for the poor people uh, in Mexico in the neighborhoods that weren't being repaired by the government. Um, and people loved him so much and the media loved him so much that when he started to challenge political re leaders to wrestling matches, um, they kind of had to show up and talk to him. Otherwise it would be very embarrassing. So, um, this is, uh, an example of using some kind of flamboyant tactic in plain sight, um, to go places you're not allowed to go. And then again, the masked man, the identity here uh, for the Zapatistas is sort of the flip side of that is the obscured identity. Um, you know, wearing a mask because you have to, because you're actually participating in an armed rebellion. But also, um, this movement of the Zapatistas was really thinking very much about their media image and about presenting their revolution to the world. Have any, having it exist on a global stage. Oh, and here's Comandante Ramo, Ramona, who's the leader of the Zapatistas, with Subcomandante Marcos. Um, and uh, again, thinking about who who is in charge here. It's uh, this is this um, under five foot tall indigenous elder who is running the Zapatista revolution at the time in 1994. Um, just one or two more slides here, um, of other things to put it all in context. Here's a group called the space hijackers, uh, with one of their tanks. They had a few, they bought a few tanks. It turns out that in the UK, it's not that hard to buy them. Um, and they dressed as these sort of comic riot police. And this was sort of the clown car that distracted the real riot police who followed them and then let their other tank roll right into the largest uh, arms show in the world in London. So I, I, sometimes these plots involve decoys, involve many layers in order to access these venues. Oh, this is a picture of a teddy bear catapult. The fun thing about this, this was at the FTAA protest in... Uh, in Quebec City, in Canada. And the fun thing about this is that it created a, a dilemma for the police because the world leaders were meeting inside the fortress city. Literally, it's the only fortress city in North America. Europe has a lot of them, but this is at the top of the hill. There's a fort in, in Quebec, and that's where they were meeting. And of course, the anti-globalization activists surrounded it and laid siege to it. And one group um, built this hilarious catapult and was flinging teddy bears in. And the police were faced with a decision. Do we arrest, do we stop the teddy bears from being flung in? And do we arrest the catapult and then look ridiculous walking away with it? Or do we let them keep flinging? Neither option was a good one. They arrested the, the, the activists and they then, you know, then there, there's this hilarious picture of them hauling around a catapult with teddy bears. If you can't make a catapult, you don't have the means, maybe you have some bread and you can strap it to your head like at the uh, in the Egyptian um, 
in the recent uh, revolution in the Arab Spring, uh, where people were strapping all kinds of things to their heads to make a statement about the violence that was being perpetrated against them. Because, of course, the state was saying that they were creating the violence and the activists were saying, no, we're, we, we don't even have helmets. You're just, you're, we're going to just strap whatever we have to our head. Um, and it became a hilarious living meme where people are walking around with all kinds of crazy makeshift helmets. Um, one more image, the flying penis that attacked Yari Kasparov in a, I think what became a very popular, uh, viral video for its moment um, and you can look this up, but this is also a warning because this phallus, which is flying, it's like an RC helicopter with a dildo attached to it. Uh, and this thing, which was flown against Kasparov, who was at the time the strongest op opposition candidate to Putin, could very well be the KGB's flying phallus. So everybody uses these tactics. And I say that because you know, it was, it became a really popular and embarrassing video that was, um, against Kasparov. It was, and so, you know, who knows who was, who was behind it, who was at the controls. Um, so to go back to what we do with the yes men, we are not beneath, uh, a few phallic metaphors ourselves because it works really well when you're trying to, um, impersonate people in power. This is an example of one time when we uh, went to a conference in Finland representing the WTO and announced that the WTO's solution to the problem of sweatshops was this thing called the employee visualization appendage, um, which was a three foot long phallus that had a kind of heads up display uh, on <laughs> on it that allowed you to um, give, to see your remote workers anywhere in the world and give them electric shock. Um, and of course the audience loved it because, because we were, they thought we were the most powerful people in the room. At the beginning of the talk, we were wearing uh, business suits and we made a breakaway business suit that I could tear off of Andy in one quick movement. And then this uh, three foot long, um, inflatable phallus was, uh, instantly deployed with a CO2 cartridge. So it inflated in a matter of maybe a second and a half. And this is, uh, a story from, from the newspaper, the second largest daily in Finland, um, that sort of explains a little bit about, about the, the, the WTO's plans. <laughs> um, so, uh, I don't know how well you could see those videos, um, that, uh, do, can I get a little feedback on that? Um, can anybody tell me how easy it was to see some of the video? It looked okay. The sound was great and okay, the video good. was very stuttery, but you could do it. Okay. So I'll show a little bit more video. I'm going to actually show. I'm going to skip this one. This is, this is a time that we, this is probably the most famous of the things that we've done. It's in our second film, which is called the yes men, uh, our, the yes men fix the world. And you can find that it's on the, wherever YouTube, other places, um, file sharing. And, uh, this is where Andy was representing, um, the, uh, the, he was representing Dow chemical, on a live television bro broadcast on the 20th anniversary of the Bhopal catastrophe. And, uh, as Dow chemical, he took responsibility for the disaster and offered to pay back the, the victims, uh, and meet their demands and clean up the plant site. So sometimes we use that tactic where we, um, if we're given enough power uh, <laughs> and we have the right platform, it's incredibly uh, useful to announce a sort of utopian solution or, or to announce that the company that you're targeting is meeting the demands that activists have been asking for for years, because then it puts the company in a real dilemma. They have no good choice. They either have to say uh, that wasn't us and we are not fixing the problem that we created, 
Um, or if they ignore it, then they have this disinformation out there in the universe. It means that they have to, they have to act. Um, so, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to skip that and I'm going to go to this, which is a more slightly more recent thing. This is also pretty old though. This is, I think in our last yes, men moving called the yes, men are revolting. And what we're doing here is, uh, creating a replica of the stage um, at the, two, the Copenhagen Climate Conference. So this is 2009, the COP15. And um, the reason we just wanted to create an, something that looked enough like it so that we could make internet videos to embed in our fake website that would allow us to make announcements as the COP15 that would, I mean, as the uh, official climate conference on behalf of Canada and Uganda. And I'm going to play a little video here. Think. Well, while Terry was looking through those documents, the world was laughing at Canada because of another one. It surfaced as a press release, or so everyone believed. But soon it was clear Canada had been punked. Leslie McKinnon reports. First, there was this demo inside Parliament, 20 years so protesters who caused a minor stir. Then this Greenpeace caper. But that got mostly reported as a breach of security story. Neither managed to get Canada's climate policy as much attention in Copenhagen as today's multi-layered hoax. The day began with this press release announcing the astonishing news that Canada was suddenly doubling its emissions cuts to 40% below 1990 levels by 2020, and that it would generously pony up $13 billion to be allocated to the African countries for emissions reduction. Then there was this article about it on what looked like the Wall Street Journal's website. Then this, a news conference purportedly by the Ugandan delegate posted on what looked like the Copenhagen conference website. It looked amazingly real until the speaker compared Canada's oil reserves to a loaded gun. And seemed ready to pull the trigger on millions of us around the globe. You left us no choice but to see you as criminal. But a press release from Environment Canada followed that seemingly deplored the spoof releases and false hopes. This turned out to be a hoax. In fact, it was all a hoax. I mean, you think it's a game, but it's not a game. It's a serious issue. You're playing games. I'm not playing games. However, truth can be stranger than fiction. This is the Prime Minister's spokesman blaming the stunt on Stephen Gilbo of the environment group Equitaire. And I want an apology. And this is also the real thing. So I was in the plenary session at the time that this happened, and I really can't comment any further. Why is it a hoax that Canada is going to do the right thing? This environmentalist thinks the whole elaborate joke forced. I had nothing to do with this one, but I'm really happy that they did it. As to who pulled this off, there are reports tonight it's a group of pranksters who call themselves the Yes Men. They say they'll have a press conference tomorrow, if you can believe that. Leslie McKinnon, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, on climate-related stunt is one of many that have happened lately. Okay, so uh, just to, to wrap that little thing up, you can see here that we're just in a basement, basically, these microphones are just made out of pipe cleaners and electrical tape. Uh, we printed out a bunch of, um, you know, we had to make our own teleprompter, print out a bunch of the logos and put paste them up on the wall. Um, we used the reverse shots of the audience um, for the videos from other videos that we found already on their website. Um, and it created this uh, kind of illusion where we could do both the big conference room and the press briefing room fairly easily. Um, so uh, we made several videos and then eventually we had the press conference the next day, uh, which highlighted mostly the position of the Ugandan uh, participants in this project, in particular Kodili Chandia, who's there uh, sitting in the middle in that uh, red suit. Um, so um, I just wanted to show that because uh, it's really interesting. And that's, again, it's 10 years old and um, it was effective at the moment, at that moment. And there weren't a lot of people talking about um, 
fake news at that at that time. Um, but uh, something that, that people are really concerned about now is whether these tactics work anymore. And I think it just depends uh, on the context. We found that sometimes they work really well. In fact, we had a successful uh, action a few weeks ago that got a lot of attention for the Bank of England's um, fiscal policy. Um, but they don't really work very well against the rogue head of state like uh, uh, Donald Trump or something. Like, there's no amount of satire or um, kind of like uh, utopian thinking that can that can work on that on that kind of wild card. Um, so uh, just to end the talking part um, or the ranting part, uh, this here we have an image of Reynard the Fox, which is of course. Uh, uh, something I'd like to leave you with. And I, I think getting in touch with all of our trickster roots is a good thing to do because when we find the roots, we also find that we have common ground with everybody else who has trickster characters in their cultural histories. Um, and this is, uh, remember, uh, confused, only confused from below. This is one of our, uh, primary tenets of Confusionism. <laughs> And we've started a school called the Trickster Academy. We can talk about that later. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and All right. talk to you in person. I think I'm back. Great. All Sorry right. that Tux took so long. I just That's okay. Uh, you had a lot of interesting stuff to say. I got ambitious with and, saying things. And I think the phrase, the KGB's flying phallus, uh, is one for the ages. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe the phallus people are listen are here now and can come forward and ask a question or tell us who they are. But uh, as far as I know, nobody knows. It could still be the KGB. <laughs> All right, we have the first questions. Questions: Why are you guys always such assholes? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. We are always such assholes um, because we don't care about what people think about us. I was once at a party where me and my brother had built this giant tower of chair chairs in, in the swimming pool. Cause it was like this fancy place. We didn't get to go to fancy places like that. And we dive off the giant tower of chairs and it was great fun. And we thought we knew how to have a party, but apparently people were really offended. And then somebody lost their golden necklace in the pool. And so we, of course were swimming and we went and found it. Uh, for the guy. And he was so excited and so overjoyed. He said, I don't care what everybody else thinks. You guys are okay. So I've always remembered that word of wisdom. And I thought, okay, our goal is not to make friends with people. Our goal is to get to that place. In fact, we can be the fall guy for a big organization that's worried about the reputation. So like if the Sierra club, big environmental organization, wants to use the kind of tactics that we do, but is worried that their membership will get to be uh, unpleased, then they can get in touch with us and we'll do it for them. So that's uh, how you finance working on the Yes Men full time? Uh, I actually finance it by working at a university. So I'm, I still teach at a university, but uh, Jacques more than I has financed it through things like that. And, and some of the actions, quite a few of the actions have been financed by by large NGOs, like the green pieces of the world. Nice. So people on the internet want to know if you've ever had to go to jail for your actions. I've never had to go to jail for these kinds of actions. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, you went to jail for unrelated reasons. I went, I went to jail for ice skating once. I was just like, come on, New York city, like just, mm. you know, I highly recommend ice skating on Prospect Park Lake. It was originally built for ice skating. You know, there's pictures of hundreds of people doing it in the 19th century. But if you do it now, uh, you get arrested. And they actually take you in overnight. Hmm. So you get to spend a night in jail, which, by the way, is a very... It's not exclusive, but it's expensive. It costs the taxpayers $1,700 per night. It's a pretty good hotel for this kind of money. Yes, yes, you could. It's like a five star. <laughs> um, 
so did you did you read any book about social engineering or did you just wing it until you figured out all the tricks it was sort of yeah it was like reverse engineering the social engineering for us because it was uh figuring it out as we went but then starting to discover a world of people doing things and um, yeah, reading about it. So, and there are so many people doing so many amazing things. I mean, I'm, I'm loving following some of these people now on even YouTubers who do stuff like this. It's, uh, um, so yeah, it's, but there are a few books. Uh, I'm reading a, a great book about early con men right now. That's really fun. It's like, uh, I can't remember the title. I'd have to grab it to read the title, but yeah, constantly, uh, constant education, And also, right. I think it's necessary also to always have innovation, you know, but, but ultimately it seems like it does boil down to some, to one thing and that is understanding what somebody wants, right? Like if you know who you're talking to and you know what they want, then you can build a world that delivers it to them and that seems to deliver to them the thing that they desire. And that is, that usually works really well. You know, it's, it's, uh, even on people who are expecting it. <laughs> All right. The next one is a trivia question, which I really enjoy as a concept. What are the top three most impactful events in world history that you can summarize in the fewest words possible? <laughs> Sounds like a game show. I like it. <laughs> top three fewest words in, in in human history in the world history in the world history um, so i guess it can include geological events before humans yeah i kind of want to say you know big bang even though i don't know um that's what i've been told i don't totally I really understand it but uh big bang how many words am i allowed i think uh, as few as possible big bang Asteroid Anthropocene. Very good. I'm sure you won whatever the game was. <laughs> I feel like I won. I feel great about that answer. How how did you guys come up with the human candle idea? And maybe explain the human candle idea. So the human candle idea was actually this goes back to the very first slide. Thanks for the callback. When um I'm holding up the business card that says Exxon. Um, we were at a conference representing Exxon Mobil in Calgary, Alberta at the Stampede Grounds, which is where they have the largest rodeo in the world. And they also have Canada's largest oil conference. And we had convinced them to host us by telling them that Lee Raymond, who was the C the former CEO of Exxon Mobil, would go to their conference. So I claimed I was from a PR agency, got in touch with the people running the conference. Um, I had a domain name that looked like uh, Hill and Knowlton or Burson Marsteller. I can't remember who one of the big PR companies that tends to do this kind of high level, you know, bullshitting. And so uh, I promised them that Lee Raymond had a very important announcement to make that would really put their conference on the map. And of course they were excited about it, but then and this is the, uh, the tricky part. At that point I had to tell them that, you know, they had to keep it secret until just before the, the, the announcement, because what he was going to say had such repercussions for the global economy that they could very well be breaking various kinds of SEC, that's like stock market laws, if they didn't embargo the information. So I said, this is important. You're part of uh, a web of, you know, you're, you're part of a bubble of secrecy. We have to maintain the secret because as soon as people know that he's going to make a big announcement, they're going to freak out because he had a new position with the government. And so they, they bought it. And in fact, this is one of those counterintuitive things where, You would think that telling them that you have this great honeypot for their conference, this guy who other people are going to register to see uh, at their conference, um, you, you'd think that, that, that then when you tell them that they can't tell anyone, 
that it would be uh, immediately blow you up, but it doesn't because they feel like they're on the inside of something big then. And so they kept the secret. And then what we decided we were going to announce was that Exxon Mobil um, had a climate change solution, which was to turn the humans uh, who die as a result of climate change into a new biofuel called Vivolium. And so we had an animated thing. It's in our second movie, The Yes Men Fix the World. But that, that idea came from us thinking about what is the logical extension of ExxonMobil's climate policy? Because at the time, it had just been revealed that ExxonMobil had done all of this very shady uh, um, suppression of knowledge about the um, about climate change. ExxonMobil had scientists working for them in the 70s that knew that climate change was a huge problem, and they had decided to suppress the information themselves. Um, and then they went on a protracted campaign of suppressing the information at the federal level in the United States and at the global level. So they became the target, and this announcement became the uh, what we were going to do. And then, of course, when we're at the conference, at the very last minute, Lee Raymond, the former CEO of ExxonMobil, who's now has a federal position with the U.S. government, doesn't show up, and a substitute takes his place on the stage. And that's yeah. So, what did I answer the question? I can't remember. I think someone wanted to know how you came up with the idea, but yeah, that I mean, was that's always idea. difficult to answer, right? Yeah, I think it was really just shooting the shit, as they say, with uh, with some friends. And as I as I remember, it was a guy called Bob Ostertag, who worked with us for a while, who uh, is actually a uh, more of like a musician and a uh, you know. Anyway, he he was the one I think who who really pushed that idea forward, and it, it turned out to be a really fun one. <laughs> I mean, it's basically a direct callback to the Jonathan Swift stuff, right? So you're really getting very into people, people's bodies. It is. It's a classic. I mean, babies, people eating them, cannibalism. I mean, these are like, you know, they, they, they hit you. They hit you right where, it, right where you feel it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, another question is, Do you worry at all that your campaigns erode trust in the media or do you just think that they should maybe pay some more attention? Yeah, no, we don't worry about that at all. I mean, it's, it's weird because for a while there was something to worry about there because people's, you know, trust in the media. I mean, the, the, now it's just a, it's just a weird landscape, totally bizarre. Um, I mean, in terms of what people believe or don't believe, um, One of the things that we do all the time, though, is reveal our hoaxes immediately after we perpetrate them. And so the result is that there is actually more information um, as opposed to, uh, you know, what we see as fake news, which is people who are perpetrating a hoax and they mean for it to exist for eternity, ideally. Like if you create a falsehood and you're not revealing it, Uh, that's the type of thing that the advertising in this industry, PR agencies have done and governments have done for centuries. Um, but our types of hoaxes are meant to be revealed right away. All right. I have a mysterious question. Yes. Oh, okay. Now I understand. What are your thoughts about the orange man? And I've just realized that that's Donald Trump. Oh, I you know, I don't know if I would have gotten or just the unrelated orange person, if you know any. Yeah, I mean, it's confusing for me because an orange man, I start thinking about Poland and about I, there's all kinds of orange people here and there, but uh, <laughs> or orange movements. Uh, anyway, the orange man. Oh, God, no. Horrible. All right. So the Dutch national football team, what's your opinion? That's different orange men, right? Yes, the Dutch football. I yeah, I, I have to I have to be a fan because my mother is Dutch. What can I say? I'll go and and also it's like a tiny country, and I like a kind of an underdog that's still out like does really ridiculously well. I mean, I don't know, I don't know. I'm not football is awesome. Yes, why not? Nothing that wrong with it. <laughs> is there a reason you don't have a bulb in your socket on your ceiling? 
Oh yeah, it's because I moved it to here. <laughs> oh, nice. This is my studio lighting. It's I, I I I got rid of that one and I created this one. Yeah, it looks great. I also have all the lights pointed at me now. <laughs> Thanks for that question. I like it. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Can we trace the lineage of the Thai rubber ducks and the Chinese umbrellas back to that taped bread? I think it's about these helmets. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> I don't know, actually. If anybody can do that, do let me know. Um, the empty bulb, though, I'm putting my finger on right now here. Um, reminds me, though, that this is like another, you know, I, I remember the CIA sabotage manual that they were dropping on El Salvador. Um, oh, actually, on Nicaragua, sorry, where they were encouraging people to, like, sabotage uh, everywhere because at the time it was, you know, communist. And so the idea was that if if people broke everything, then the country would come to a standstill. So they suggested things like taking the light bulb out and putting a coin in there and putting the light bulb back in. So I, I don't know, you know, everybody uses these tactics. It's again, thinking about, uh, about the CIA's flying, flying penis, you know, the oh, no, it's the CIA. Manual. Yeah. CIA sabotage manuals. Uh, maybe one last question. Do you have any projects in the pipeline? I mean, I assume you don't want to talk about them, but you can. Well, you know, we have a movie about walls that we're working on, um, but it's it, it took we took a hiatus, you know, with COVID, and uh, we have a whole bunch of other things that are in the works. Some of them we're doing independently, not as the Yes Men, but I'm doing stuff, and uh, Andy is doing stuff. And um, yeah, we're also always trying to recalibrate because, you know, the, the, the terrain is changing so quickly and it's such a strange and interesting moment, particularly in the United States, but also all over the world. Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's many questions that are along the lines of like, how do you feel about satire in this year when it just seems like half the news is satire? right? Or at least it feels just completely unhinged, right? Yeah. And I don't think a lot of times it doesn't, I don't think satire about Donald Trump works. I didn't even think that any of the stuff that was on Saturday Night Live was funny, you know, where they impersonate the, the people in the administration. It's just like worse versions of the real thing that's really funny if you could actually laugh about it if it wasn't real. Um, I mean, it must have been the same, like looking at Hitler in the in the 30s. You know, like you, you probably look at that and think this can't be real. But you know, it's here's this crazy looking guy doing saying crazy shit. Uh, and so then, what do you do? And I think that you you choose different tactics for a while, but you fight. It seems like the funniest thing to do for him would to just pretend he's giving a coherent speech, right? Totally. Yeah. I mean, it's like, <laughs> he keeps out doing himself. What happened in the final weeks of the campaign and just after with Giuliani and the, the four seasons, total landscaping and the face melting off. And the, I mean, there were so many things where you just like the levels of crazy theater were, oh man. I, yeah. Anyway. I mean, you could have definitely just claimed that as a yes man stunt. Definitely. Definitely. It was a stroke of genius that. <laughs> yes. All right. Maybe a last question. Do you have any, any things that failed spectacularly that you are yes. want to reveal to the, to yes. the world? We have many things that have failed spectacularly. And uh, there are some of them that you can read about on the yes man website, which is at the yes org. And one in particular that I recommend reading about that we documented, at least in text, is an event where we impersonated a group called the International Web Police, who claimed to be securing the Internet. This was back in the late 90s, or around 2002 or something. Anyway, it was a, it was a funny event. And uh, yes, I won't, I'm not going to get into it here, but it amuses me just to think about it. <laughs> all right thank you very much somehow you've so disappeared much. from my screen
All right, now there you are. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I think everybody. we will go offline at some random point now. Goodbye, okay. Internet. Goodbye.